<coughs> okay, we are, I'm hoping this is working. If it's working, then we are in business. Uh, this is my first time trying this with OBS, so if I screw up, um, uh, I, I apologize. And um, yes, apparently I'm live. Let's just let's get this going. Um, I'm just going to wait for a few seconds and see if, yes, it says I am live. Okay, well, I'm live on YouTube. Uh, the question is whether or not I'm live on Facebook. Uh, we are talking uh, about Dungeons and Dragons. We're talking about Fifth Edition. We're talking about OGL, and we're talking about uh, what our future, uh, my future with it, will be. And uh, spoilers that there will be a future. Um, but we are going to give it a second here, uh, just to make sure that uh, we are working. I have this funny feeling that. I am not on Facebook. Um, I will keep on talking, though. I know I'm pretty sure I am on. I have this funny feeling. Yeah. Okay, so I know I'm on uh, there. I got comments going. Thank you, Don. Uh, now the question is whether or not I'm actually on Facebook. It's not, it's not a huge deal, but I'd be nice if I was on Facebook, but it doesn't look like I am. Um, so uh, let's see here. One more minute. I'm going to see about to see if this is going to work. Go back there. And let's go live here and let's see if this works. Okay. Just had it here. At least I got OBS working, and this background hopefully is is doing its business, which is neat. I may have to play with the uh, the blue screen. I don't actually have an actual blue screen, so this is um, best I got because I don't want to show people the the clothing behind me as I am trying to get this thing going. Um. Let's see here. Let's go one more time. Yeah, for some reason. It's uh, not letting me. Oh, there we go. I think that's it. One more second. I hope you guys will be patient. And settings. That works. So yeah, I am not on. Let's see. Um, I'll go back. Um, yeah, that should be working. Got everything. It does not want to. Let's try this again. Now we're working. I think. Yes, now we're working. I thank uh, Franco. Okay, so we are online with. Um, good, 
Gimmick video source, we are going. All right, so hopefully we are working. Okay. <laughs> I look forward to a mature response. Well, no, I, that's that's one thing I'm I'm trying very much to do is is have a mature response. I think it's really important that we have that. Um, I am going to say one thing that's it's probably going to be controversial. We'll get into that uh, the moment I look into the camera. <laughs> so uh, I think everything's going well here. Um, yeah, looks like I am online with Facebook. So let's uh, let's talk what's going on. So I've already made a comment video on this before. I've already talked about uh, what's going on with the with the OGL. OGL. My diggles are being uh, active, uh, but there are a few things I wanted to, to uh, go over. Uh, first of all, I have to admit that I was probably a bit. Uh, I was not the alarmist. I was the opposite one. I wasn't a huge naysayer. I wasn't saying that this is all just BS. Um, I was saying that I didn't think for one second that wizards would be dumb enough to completely kill the OGL. I sincerely believe that. I did not believe that they would abandon the OGL. I assumed what they were doing is updating the OGL to account for a digital distribution for their virtual tabletop and a few other applications there that we didn't mention. Um, a lot of people were worried that they were going to, and there's part of me that I also didn't understand the political, obviously political, but the internal structure uh, regarding uh, what's going on with Wizards of the Coast, what's going on with Hasbro, the change in leadership, the people that are in charge of Wizards of the Coast today are not the same people that are in charge that were in charge of Wizards of the Coast back, to my knowledge, uh, back in 2010 or 20, 2008 with, uh, uh, with the fourth edition, and Odef certainly wasn't worked around back in 2000 when the first OGL got made. Now, I know, and I've mentioned this before, back in 2008, uh, then we signed on to the OGL. We Sorry, we signed on to the GSL. The GSL came out. Uh, we had just released Amethyst a D20 uh, in, in April, and then the fourth edition in Players' Fan Books came out, I think, in May of that, uh, of that same year. In July, just before my birthday, the, uh, the GSL came out, and within two days we signed on to it because I didn't think it was going to be a huge problem. And also, we were a new company. We had really nothing to lose. At that same time, Goodman Games was also probably the highest profile company that signed on to the GSL. They reached out to me because they saw that I had signed on to the GSL to publish Amethyst. What we weren't aware, of course, was the, the kind of the alarmist approach a lot of people took regarding the GSL and how it proved unpopular. Now, some people think and some people believe that uh, it was the GSL that 100% killed it. And, and they're partially correct. It's not 100% true. Uh, the issue primarily occurred before. Uh, some people kind of make the incorrect assumption that Paizo saw the GSL and started immediately working on Pathfinder. And that's not true. The truth was is that there was supposed to be a NDA conference call that was going to occur in January with several major players. I was trying to get on that, but in order to get these early files, you had to pay $5,000. And then you would get the, the files before anyone else did. And that would give you the opportunity to create content and have it out relatively quickly. This did not occur. And apparently a smaller conference call without the $5,000 fee did occur uh, a couple months later. And what was written wasn't something that uh, the people liked. I know Goodman was part of that call. And it was at that point, a lot of these companies, uh, Paizo, I think Goodman, I think Green Ronin and Mongoose might have been present, where that's what they decided that this was not going to work in their favor. And so the, uh, even before they knew what the GSL was saying, Paizo was already working on the construction of, of Pathfinder. 
the other issue that happened, and this is something people kind of forget. People say, oh, G the 4th edition was killed by this GSL. 4th edition went with it was killed because of its rule set. 4th uh, edition was also killed because of the economic state at the time. Uh, a lot of people may not remember back in 2008, the uh, U.S. economy, global economy, um, it, uh, was not very good. And as a result, uh, a lot of third-party publishers, regardless of which system they were publishing, looked at the landscape and believed that nobody was interested in buying books when the U.S. economy was tanking. And that was actually the reason why the Amethyst Foundations, our, our book that we did with Goodman Games, uh, sorry, uh, went and um, and pushed back. Our, like we, were, we, we could have published Am uh, Amethyst, probably wouldn't have been as good, but we could have published Amethyst as early as the fall of 2008. Um, we, it took a bit longer for us to do certain things, uh, but we could have rushed it. We could have gotten it out. Um, I got a few things done. I managed to, uh, to tweak a few things. Um, but Goodman wanted to sit on it because he felt the economy wasn't there and people weren't going to be buying it. I think he was wrong. I think he, what he should have done was publish it right then and there where, you know, where, where the strike was hot and so forth. Uh, but he didn't. He wanted to sit and wait. Uh, it was a gamble. He thought that fourth edition would still be huge by 2010 when the economy started to recover. Uh, this was an incorrect assumption on his part. And unfortunately, by the time fourth edition came out, so by the time fourth edition Amethyst came out, the writing was already on the wall. So there were lots of, yeah, it was absolutely how, how to RPG. There are a lot of reasons why 4E failed, and I remember how complex the situation was. It was a combination of the GSLs, a combination of the rule set, and there was a, I, I think obviously fourth edition would have succeeded. Like if the GSL went, went OGL, they just, they didn't, they just updated the OGL for fourth edition and didn't do anything. Basically what they did with the fifth edition in 2016. I think we would have seen a lot more people come on board fourth edition and we would have seen it continue because of the third party support. Because once again, if uh, fourth edition had done what it, it should have done at the beginning, which means release the rules four months to the uh, to the third party to allow them to create products to have stuff so they can release products as early as September. Uh, we would not have seen a lot of these third party companies jump ship. Uh, some people think it was it was the rule system. I I I, I, I will I will swear on on a on a stack of carpet samples that the rule set itself was not the primary reason it, it part of it was the abandonment of third parties of support in combination with other things but i do believe the economy also had a um and yeah <laughs> yeah yeah the books all yeah i do actually have oddly enough i actually have more 4e books than i have of any other system i mean i do have a cop, quite a bit of 3.5 i think a lot of people have, have a lot of 3.5 uh, but i actually have more 4e books than i have 5e books this is one thing I'll get to um, where I say the fact that I am Wizards' absolute worst customer. I am the, I am their biggest asshole. I need I, uh, because I am the worst type of person. They hate people like me. I am a third-party publisher producing content for their system. I have not paid royalties to do so. And on top of that, I'm an old white guy who doesn't pay for D uh, for D and D Beyond. I, uh, I I I don't pay for any virtual tabletop. Uh, I play all my games uh, uh, live or through just Skype because my games are entirely role-playing based and I have not paid money for Wizards books since the original three. Um, oh yeah, I know. I, 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 I'm, yeah, hi Fred, how are you doing? Um, so that's, that's, so I, I'm, I'm actually quite literally the worst person for them because I have not paid money to Wizards. Um, let me show you a little too loud. Um, I have not paid any money to Wizards uh, since the original release of the 5th edition. I have bought books, but I've bought third-party books, things I found was interesting. Yes, that or my Degu's um, chewing at bark. Um, <laughs> so let's see here. Um, okay, so I don't see any comments. I think I am on still live on, on Facebook. Okay, so, so let's start off. Start off. Uh, I was assuming that Wizards of the Coast would be doing this, uh, would not go this route, and, and they do. So this is about me. First of all, I say how to save d and I think we also need to define what D&D &D is. A bit of a sore throat. 
Um, and that's why I'm asking people to not give up on D&D. Because D- Dun- Dungeons & Dragons is not Hasbro. Dungeons & Dragons is not Wizards of the Coast. Dungeons & Dragons is its community. Um, and we need to find a solution where we remain united. And I think this is critically important. A lot of people are, are like, I'm abandoning D&D and everything because of Wizards. And I'm like, you don't have to abandon this rule set. Remember, this Dungeon Dragons as an entity predated um, every company that's existing now. I mean, basically, uh, with, with few exceptions, very few companies were, uh, existed that, that are publishing stuff that were that date all the way back to the original publication of Dungeons & Dragons. Dungeons & Dragons, uh, someone said the same thing about, um, to a lesser degree, about Star Wars and Star Trek. The fact that, yeah, there's an entity entity that owns it. But to say that they control it, to say that they are, they encompass that IP is 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 ridiculous. Um, Star Wars is basically run by the people who who were fans of Star Wars back in the eighties. The you know, and that's and it's almost become folk art. It becomes it's part of our tapestry, a part of our society. So if someone says, "I'm abandoning D and D," I go, "Are you really, or are you just just going to play with the books you have?" And people have said that whenever we, whenever an author gets their books uh, adapted, someone asks them, you know, are you worried about them, uh, you know, destroying your books? And the person, and the author says, my books are right behind me. That no, no one's doing anything to them. And so when someone says, I'm, 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 I'm done with Lord of the Rings, I go, really? Are you really done with them? Are you just going to continue reading the original books? Because nothing, no one's taken that away. And so same thing is, no one's taken away the three point five books you have. No one's taken away the five e books you have. So you still absolutely can play D and D, and I think this is important that we we send that message to the powers that be that says that no matter what you do, you can't take this this. You, no matter what you do, D and D will live on. Dungeons Dragons. If if there's a massive global apocalypse, corporations are just you know, corporations are wiped out. People are are. It's a debacle. And ninety percent of the population was, you know, was in the crapper, and corporations don't exist. Someone's gonna pick up Dungeon uh, Dungeon Dragons book and go, "Hey, in the midst of this apocalypse, let's try to be wizards in a in a world that doesn't exist." D and D will exist long before people have forgotten about Hasbro, long before they've forgotten about Wizards of the Coast. D and D will persist. It persisted when it changed hands from TSR to Wizards. It, cha- it it persisted when Hasbro bought Wizards, and and it will continue on since then. I think it's important that we don't give up. Um, which comes to where we are right now, b- abandoning the OGL potentially, or like so, so. Basically, we have three options. Here here are the options for the future. The first one is that we abandon the OGL and publish works. Now, this is something people have said is risky. But more and more videos are coming out. There's been videos that have been bouncing around a lot uh, in the last few days saying that you can publish without the OGL. It depends on a couple of things, which, which I'll get into. And will, that is so distracting, can you do, can you do it with worrying, without worrying a bit about getting, getting sued? Now, the thing is, is that someone will, may file a lawsuit just to scare you. Uh, they may do it just to kind of scare people into submission. And that's entirely possible. Um, I'm a pretty good target, but there are bigger targets. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a platinum publisher on drive through RPG, uh, which means I am basically according to them. I am in, the, I am in the top tiers. Uh, obviously I'm not mongoose. I'm not green Ronin, and I'm not Paizo. Uh, but I do have mythical bad shilling products. I do have some of the most successful products for fifth edition on the market. So I, I, I do, I, I know I'm on their radar. And I know that I was on the radar to the point that I was, when I was still supporting the GSL, when I was still supporting the GSL, um, this is not a common, this, this is a pretty common secret. A lot of people do know this. The fact that Mike Merles did reach out to me uh, to talk about the future. Um, and there there was obviously a lot of controversy involving um Morris from Enworld uh, and confidential information that was leaked um, against my wishes, and and I had access and I knew I had access to the Alpha rules, the plate, the friends and family play test rules before anyone else did. I had um, access to um, 
the future. I knew that they were going to go OGL, and that's why when I announced the Amethyst Kickstarter back in 2014, and I said we were going to go OGL, so we were going to go, we were going to support Fifth Edition, and a lot of people said you can't do that. And I said, yes, I can. And I had two reasons why I knew I could publish for 5th edition back in 2014 before 5th edition even came out. One is that, once again, I knew because of uh, uh, what happened with Goodman Games, which I'll get into, that I could publish outside of the OGL without worrying about it. That was point one. Point two, I knew the OGL was coming because Mike Merles told me it was. I did not realize it would not come for another two years. I thought it was just on the horizon. He also said uh, about Wizards opening up their own storefront. They did not do that. He did not mention DM's Guild, which ended up happening. So things do change over the course of two years. Now, what I was talking about with 4th edition with Goodman Games is that we signed on to GSL beginning of July. We were already working on our 4th edition book. We had Read the Rules. We were working on it. Goodman Games was working on it as well. But one stipulation of the GSL is that you could not publish anything before, I think, November of that year. Um, and that was kind of a big deal because they wanted to do strike with iron. It was hot. That was the term. And because of that, Goodman games could not afford to hold off their modules. So they went and they published, do I actually have any here? That would have been smart to have gotten one of those. Um, they released a series of adventures, dungeon crawl classics for fourth edition. I have all of these because, uh, he sent me those. So when I started writing modules, I would know the format. So I got a bunch of free modules from Goodman Games, and these were the fourth edition ones. Harley Stroh did a couple of them. Now, this was interesting. These came out in August. So technically, they could not. They were not OGL compliant. Uh, I, I think they, they were OGL compliant technically, but they weren't GSL compliant. So he, he said, use with fourth edition rules. There was no other um, symb symbology on there. He didn't have that cool fourth edition plaque that we got later from the GSL. And what was interesting is that only one of the three modules that I have contained the original 3.5 OGL dialogue. The other ones had no OGL at all. There was no indication that it was no mention of the OGL, no mention of D&D. It just said fourth edition compatible and went on from there. And Goodman Games is, Joseph Goodman is not an idiot. He's a very smart man. He's a very rich man. He doesn't do things like that without being certain and he said to me, I know what I can do. I've been in talks with wizards to make sure that they know I'm doing this. And they know perfectly well that they couldn't stop him. So that precedent is there. A lot of people don't bring up that precedent, but that precedent does exist. You can produce stuff outside of the OGL without having to confirm to it. The advantage of the OGL was that you could copy text from the SRD into your document. This was very useful if you're creating your own entirely D20 variant. A good example of this was just recently with Everyday Heroes. I've talked with Dave Scott. I've made little jokes about the fact that we're direct competition because he wrote D20 Modern's update, which was Everyday Heroes, and I wrote one called uh, Ultra Modern. Now, when you get down to it, there's two very big differences. They see uh, Dave Scott in an interview with Enworld said the big difference was that they were modern and I was high uh, futuristic, and that's not the case. The biggest difference came down to the fact that Everyday Heroes is designed as a self enclosed to rule set it has it's literally defined as its own rule it's the everyday heroes rule set it is not a 5e it's not a D, &D compatible rule set it is everyday heroes um, and it runs off of the 3.5 uh ogl from 2000 uh, or the or the new ogl for from 2016 so they did they copied all the rules from the srd into their book and created a new system using the srd um, and that's the reason why they are they and a bunch of other companies that do that, which is very common, are, are the ones that are worrying the most because they are the ones that will be in violation with their products if this comes to pass. However, if you don't copy stuff from the SRD, you technically don't need to put in the OGL. Now, our books do have the OGL language present. And the reason why we did that, we did that basically to cover our butts. But the big difference, once again, between Ultramodern and Everyday Heroes is that Ultramodern does not copy-paste from the SRD. I think the only potential uh, exception is Burst Fire Rules from the Dungeon Master's Guide. And even then, I have to double-check whether or not I did copy-paste that. I don't copy stuff. I and mean, that's the reason why some people actually... Com this is ironic. People had complained recently that... You know, they prefer some other books, and the, and the biggest problem with Ultramodern, one person said this just two weeks ago, the biggest problem with Ultramodern was that 
ultra modern uh, required the original core books. You you didn't you couldn't just refer to everything in the core book. You had to have the PHP and DMG handy. Maybe another monster manual, but definitely the PHP. And my response to that was that is that aren't you going to is like this is designed to be 100 compatible with fifth edition D and D, and that was the intent. And so Everyday Heroes is not beholden. In fact, this is the, the I made this comment with Paco uh, Garcia, the fact that. If you go to Drive Through RPG site and you look under uh, Dungeons and Dragons, Everyday Heroes, and my products are on the top 100. If you click down to um, to the um, OGL uh, third party stuff, uh, Everyday Heroes and Ultra Modern are in the top 100. I think we're in the, we're in the top 20 actually. If you go further and go fifth edition OGL, Everyday Heroes is no longer there, and my game is. This is because. Ultimately, they weren't beholden to be 100% compatible with 5th edition D&D, where Ultra Modern was supposed to. So we are in a slightly better situation because we can technically abandon the OGL because we don't copy stuff. I would have to go over just to make sure, maybe play with some wording. Hey, Flutes. Um, I will get to all, all the comments. I just want to get this one thing. So uh, we could abandon the OGL if we wanted without worrying too much about blowback because of the situation uh, with our products. And I don't think there's any exception. Um, even like I'm working on the rebuild of Amethyst factions, and that absolutely does not have anything from the SRD. Amethyst and Ultra Modern have the same skeleton, so I will have to go into that. I will be updating these first with Amethyst because Amethyst is being updated right now. Uh, so if I end up uh, doing that, there'll be an updated file that comes through where the OGL language will be missing from the credits page. And we will be listed as a 5e uh, unauthorized product. And that would be kind of our disclaimer. <coughs> now, that's option one, abandon the OGL. Uh, option two is terminate all of our fifth edition products. Now, that's really bad. And now, that would be killing off 90% of my revenue stream because most of my products that we sell are fifth edition. So that would be limit. That would be connected to the third option, which was give up entirely. Now, um, I am one of the few people that is a full-time writer uh, with novels, scripts, and so forth. Uh, I, I get revenue from a lot of things, but I, I stay at home. I'm a full-time writer. So a lot of people who are just giving up, they can do so because ultimately it was just a hobby for them. But for us, where it is our primary income stream, and it's like either this or I pick up a backup profession like welding, it's one of those situations where I'm obviously much more invested. So I, I can't just give up. Otherwise, I'm giving up completely. So if I terminate my OGL products, I'm, it's the same as me giving up. So um, I do see a lot of companies that are responding. Some are abandoning the OGL. Some are proceeding with legal action against Wizards of the Coast. And I think this is more or less a threatening them to kind of come forward and, and to make things officials and hopefully kind of move through this. Um, and then there are companies that are terminating their OGL products or putting them on hold. And I think this is unhealthy. And so if there are publishers that are watching this video, and that's entirely possible that a couple of them might, if that is the case, uh, I am telling you now, I am begging you, do not do that. Do not put your projects on hold. Do not cancel your 5e products and, and don't abandon your plans. Companies that are abandoning all their 5e products are kind of abandoning the rest of us to handle this fight by themselves. They're giving up and they're running away. And I will call that out for it is. If you are just, you're, kill, you're killing your 5e product line instantly and then going off to do other things or you're closing up shop altogether, I'm like, you are taking this option because you can. And you're leaving the rest of us to try to fight this battle without you. And if something happens and we win and the and, and we have one of three best case scenarios pops up, then suddenly you'll come back and, and, and I'd be like, well, you ran away when we were in this fight. Why did you run away when we were in this fight? So there's a part of me that that's having that's that's trying to stop myself from going to these companies that are holding all their 5e, canceling their product uh, projects. As it's, it's, it, it is a little cowardly. I think, I think that it's, you know, we had the same issue with the GSL. There were game companies that were screaming bloody murder. And back then I was like, guys, 
read it, wait for it, and, and then make a calculated response. And the number of times I've seen game designers um, become slaves to their emotions and they cannot resort. I mean, me posting uh, about Open d d changing uh, my Deus Mac and Assemble to the Open d d that is as a severe emotional outburst as I am known for. I generally don't do that publicly because I've seen too many game designers detonate their careers because they can't keep it in them. They can't control their own emotions. And that's something very important because corporations do this all the time because they have multiple voices. But the number of times we've seen, of course, we've seen it very dramatically in just the last year with Elon Musk, the fact that you cannot let your emotions and uh, control you. Uh, yeah, I'll scream bloody murder to my wife, literally getting being stressed out and angry about this. But we're in a situation where we have no choice. We have to move forward without the OGL because Ultra Modern is our most successful product. That's first. The other thing that's really, really critical is the fact that we have a Kickstarter getting delivered, Affinity, right now. It's in distribution. And we have another Kickstarter that is that's in production right now, Amethyst. So I have the new reboots for Quintessence and Factions coming out. We have the third book, Renaissance, coming out probably later this year. I am not going to not publish this. I am absolutely going to publish this. I have backers. I have investors that I have to answer to. So in situations like this, uh, I, I really think it's a very bad it's, it, it's, very, it's a very bad look on us as third-party companies to just immediately give up and run away and potentially alienate our own audience if we're in this fight. If we're trying to 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 continue this fight, we help. We're basically telling our audience that we're not giving up on them. So, and that's why I say to people, do not give up on D and D. D and D is not Hasbro. D and D is not Wizards. D and D is its community, and we need to find a solution where we remain united. Um, and there are people that are being affected, and it's it's the way they get affected is is quite severe. I mean, obviously, companies can fail. But it's more than that. It's more than that. We're looking at the potential demise of major companies that have a lot of audio, a lot of positive equity with the audience. Um, you know, you have Mongoose, Green Rona, but specifically Paizo. Like Paizo, when fourth edition was stumbling, and I, I had an open letter to Wizards about their future. And this is one of the reasons why I think Mike Morales reached out to me. It was a very, very famous uh, open letter that uh, was on Living Dice, and it got a little viral. <clears throat> uh, Wizards did not ever come back to me. It was a couple of years before Mike Merles did, but Paizo did reach out to me and then invite me to write stuff for their rule system, and I have been. I abandoned them recently because because Fifth Edition just devoured almost all of Pathfinder's market, and then they split their diminishing community with Pathfinder Second Edition. So now I'm seeing I'm seeing Savage World say, sales. I'm seeing Fate sales. No one is buying my Pathfinder books anymore. Um, and I, that's the unfortunate truth. And I wish they hadn't done that. I wish they had kept um, with their system. And now they're they're in this situation um, deeper than anybody else. So we have these big companies. We have virtual tabletops that might be threatened. And this is going to be tough, especially since some people like me have promised and are supporting these. And 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 we know going forward that um, when the D and D VTT is a hundred percent, uh, you will never see third party stuff on there. They will do everything in their power to prevent that. Or if we do manage to win at this fight, um, we might still be able to put out five or even 5.5 or even 6.E products, but we won't, unless we sign on to their draconian policy, they won't let us on their virtual tabletop. And that's one thing that they will, they will dance because they were, tr they will try to suppress and kill rival vtts and um they'll do that in order to force people to go on their system and therefore uh, conform to their 1.1 gsl which is what it is it's not an ogl it's a gsl you can't have an ogl with that many restrictions so that's the other people that are affected virtual tabletops finally we have what a lot of people are mentioning and that are game stores now the flgs are friendly local game stores as third-party publishers, we've always, always tried to acknowledge them, even though, yes, the vast majority of our income and sales come from digital sales, from drive through which we'll get into. But game stores support our Kickstarters. They, uh, a lot of them do carry our products. They went through a very tough time, 
um, when role playing games were fading, and when D and D came back, they came back as well. So they're carrying D and D, but they're also carrying all the third party stuff as well. A lot of them do. And now, thanks to board games, they're doing a lot better. But if suddenly they're told that they that they can't sell anything other than first party uh, wizard stuff, that's going to hurt them. That's going to potentially hurt some of their sales. And there are some companies out there. Um, uh, Noble Knight that that are a are huge supporters of third party and a huge chunk of their product line are third party products that that fall under the OGL and this is sales that they are not going to earn because of this. Uh, they ha- they commonly carry all my ultra modern stuff and I always appreciate that. So yeah, friendly local game stores are, are going to be affected by this, and I think we need to bring them into this fight to know the fact that what they're doing with the OGL is wrong. Wizards is trying to do things it's completely digital to the point where they are looking to cut out the game stores out of their system. In the same way where Best Buy, it was a Best Buy, uh, where um, GameStop got affected when all the video games went digital. So, yeah, that's that's one thing that, that's, that we need to acknowledge is acknowledge the um, what game stores are going through. Um, let's just go through comments here. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of reasons why 4E failed. Um it was a complex situation. Uh, it did not help matters that 4E failed for, I, I said, it failed because of the third party. It failed because of the 2008 financial crisis. Um, it failed also because Wizards didn't know what it was. When it launched, whenever somebody complains to me about the fact that Ultra Modern, Hot, Ultra Modern 5 has like a five-page errata, the errata, the first errata for the Player's Handbook for 4th Edition was 26 pages. Fourth edition was it launched in a very poor state. It was a very broken system. The monster manual that came out was also flawed, and and we know this because when they got all their feedback after the fact, uh, the third monster manual, for example, looks and ha- is presented completely differently from the first monster manual. And on top of that, then we had the D and D Essentials line, which Mike Rolls put out. And that's what they should have released. When 4th edition came out, it should have been the Essentials books that came out several years later. That should have been the original 4th edition. So by the time 4th edition Essentials came out, no one cared, which was too bad because I really liked the Essentials system. So there were a lot of things. And I think it was because it was half-baked when it launched. Uh, They were trying to push hard digital in a time where digital was 100% embraced at that point, not like it is now. Uh, and that's unfortunately how it is. Uh, oh yeah, and the and the and the, the final the final company that's going to get. Sc- oh no, I mentioned that. Um, so what else we have here? Um, uh, as long as you're surprised, how's were made the OGL 1.1. If it did, it seemed insane. Yeah, it does seem insane. Um, but the more I've been reading other or reading other reports, the more I've been watching people's videos, it seems now the reason why some people said they saw this coming was because of the political shifts, the fact that. You know, 10 years ago, Wizards of the Coast was a small branch of Hasbro. And of them, the Hasbro basically have these tiers of their product lines. And their A tier gets all of their money and all of their investment in comparison to their B and C tiers. And uh, Magic was an A tier and D&D wasn't even close. And that's why Magic got all the love and, and, and attention. Now we're in 2022. And not only has D and D risen up to this huge um, position, Magic has also fallen. So Magic has now been demoted effectively because they can't monetize it as well. But the announcement came out a few months, uh, some not long ago, where somebody at Wizards said that the biggest problem with Dungeons and Dragons is that eighty percent of your money is generated by dungeon masters, and that the players are under monetized. So we knew what this meant. We, we knew that what we were going to see is a very spiffy, very, very fancy, very nice looking um, virtual tabletop that would have microtransactions. It would be, it would operate the same way as we see Counter-Strike or, 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 or Team Fortress where you can't just load in an image of your character. You can purchase things for your character. Um, you can purchase hats and stuff like that. We That's the direction we were going, is to try to monetize players. And to try to get as many players onto that platform, it helps if they can find a way to kill their competition. 
And as I said, the pen and paper traditional people like myself are, are not their demographic. They don't care about us. So they don't really care whether or not we scream bloody murder that they're abandoning the OGL because in their views, and this is something that I've gone over and I, and I get really, really upset with people that are saying, well, you just had a free ride all this time. It's about time you, you, you paid your money. And then, you know, they're giving you this thing free of charge. And I was just like, first of all, nothing that they've given me is a charity. It's it's not how that works. You have to also remember what is actually copyright with D and D. Their settings, um, some of their monsters. The, this is their intellectual property. At the Dungeons and Dragons name, one thing they do not have copyrighted are how the game plays, strength, dexterity, rolling d20, saving throws. All of that is stuff that is practically public domain because of how the legal system works and the fact that thanks to Monopoly and, and Parker Brothers, you can't copyright a rule. You can copyright uh, how it's presented, but you can't copyright the rule itself. You can't copyright a, a process. And so all the rules for D&D are, are not technically copyright, but their IP is. The IP, which, which I also might add once again, that I don't use. We don't use terms like Mind Flayer. We don't use terms like uh, Beholder. These are copyrighted. And we don't say the word Dungeons and Dragons because that's an IP. That's a, that's a trademark. And once again, we don't touch them either. But they can't copyright um, certain things. They can't copyright a dragon. They may be able to copyright a gold dragon, but they can't copyright a dragon. They can't copyright elf. They can copyright a gray elf or a drow. And in fact, I've been reading that they can't even copyright that. Uh, but that's a long story. They can copyright Forgotten Realms, like Dragonlance, and those things. But ultimately, and if I was publishing in those areas, then maybe you can say that they're letting me play in their sandbox. But what they don't, the, what we have here is a situation where they have their own sandbox, and then they, and then all of us, with these people who generate the OGL, created a new sandbox that everyone can can pull sand from and create their own world worlds using it. I use a set of rules that have that were originally conceived back in the late 70s that were perfected over the course of three or four decades. And then to to ensure that there would be no legal ramifications, they made those rules accessible to everybody. They did this for a couple reasons. One, the market was extremely fractured. There were a thousand game systems. D&D had a small market share. And there was already the rise of open gaming. We already had open gaming. Fusion was an op was was practically open gaming. It had some licensing, but you could produce stuff for Fusion, um, and I did. I produced content for for Fusion. My Alien Fusion game was something that was I was very proud of. Um, so this was already out there, and they created this this legal document to more or less assure us that. You could use our expression without us going after you. We are basically saying, like, you were already going in this direction. Here's the framework so we can unify. And there was a couple reasons to do that. And this is, if you were back in 3.5, 2000, you saw this. We had a massive just deluge of 3.5 products. 3.5 exploded. It became hugely popular. They even released 3.5. When 3rd edition came out, then 3.5 came out. And that was a huge seller. Uh, their sales were not affected by the third party. In fact, quite the opposite. Because of penetration, unfortunately, unless you were producing content for 3.5, your game systems died, and a lot of well-known game companies fall, uh, fell, and their product lines fell under. I, I, Palladium rule systems I don't think have ever recovered. I don't think GURPS has ever recovered. You basically had to go 3.5 or nothing at all. And... Some people just took those rules verbatim, and some of them didn't. You still needed the PHB. And when I did out with Amethyst, you still needed the, the original PHB. So that was also a very much a, a, a critical point. Now, when 4th edition came out, they said, we're going to run off this GSL. And they did not say, we did not appreciate people um, creating new books from our hard work. That's not what they said. They wanted to make sure that the um, that the products that were using fourth edition were, I guess, ethical. They weren't they weren't racist. They weren't bigoted or anything like that. Because some products came out for three point five that were really bad, and there's some of the companies come, came out that literally copy pasted the SRD with Go Faster Tripes and sold that, and they didn't want that either. They wanted original, neat settings that weren't 
weren't insulting or sexist or racist or bigoted or something like that. And that was kind of their intent. That was their original intent. It wasn't to kill competition. It wasn't to do that. That was that was their wording. They might have publicly, privately said they wanted to curtail competition. And obviously, this blew up in their face because all it did was create the schism that happened before 3.5 as Pathfinder, uh, 13th Age, Savage World, Fake Core, all filled in the gaps and 4th Edition failed. When 5th Edition came out, almost immediately there was this push to create a third-party content. And when they came out with their OGL, which I think came out in 2016, now we had this deluge. And people say 5th edition came became popular because of its third-party support. Yes, it is. It's also a very good system, and there's also tons of money put into it. And live streaming started to become big at that same time. So it was a, a combination of things. If people say that the third-party is the only reason why 5th edition is popular... That's even I'm, I'm I'm a publisher of third edition. And I don't believe that. I think we contributed heavily to it, <coughs> but to say that we're solely responsible for success, I think, is incorrect. Um, I've actually asked people whether or not you can create a fifth edition or a SRD rule set where you've taken all of their all the all the public domain stuff, strength, dexterity, how the rules work and rewrite 5th edition without using any of their any of their uh, writing and create a new OGL and call it I called it um, open source 5 OS 5 um, and do that. I know that people have done things similar. Um, Morris told me uh, I haven't seen Level Up. I know Level Up quite quite well, but I don't. I don't own the Level Up system. I don't know their SRD. I don't know how the rules work. So he has his own OGL based around Level Up. That's also based off of the this architecture. He could potentially go completely um, uh, out of OGL and just say Level Up is a D20 system that just happens to be 100% compatible with 5th edition D&D. And I was thinking about that myself. Like, I have enough art assets. I, uh, I'm enough of a, of a rules hound. I can create a system that is 100% compatible with D&D without using any of their terminology. And I can, and, and maybe I would tweak a few things that I, I felt could learn, could be used, things we've learned since then that, have, that aren't in the original PHB that creates um, a, a 5.75, something like what we did with Paizo, something that's 5th edition derivative um, that employs all of that. Now, I could do that, but I know in this atmosphere there will come a point where wizards will come after me be saying, be saying that this is a copyright infringement and I, do not, I don't have the capital to fight them in court. <coughs> if... A uh, communal group of people got together, uh, publishers, and they all created this together. I would want, I'd, I'd want to be part of that process. Uh, and then I've been hearing rumors of people doing it, and names have been dropped. I don't know who they are, but I would like to get involved in that. Um, but um, and people have asked me. I've I've thought about doing a variant player's handbook. In fact, Renaissance, the third, or Revelations, the third Amethyst book, has is going to include a lot of mechanics which I have been thinking of creating an entire system that's 5e derivative, but employs all the stuff from Ultramodern, all the stuff from Revelations into this completely 3.5, 5D, 5e derivative book. Um, and depending on what happens in the next few months, that may end up happening. Um so we have here, OGL 1.1 is likely a response to the investor call where it was mentioned that D&D was under monetized. The majority of the licenses relates to some way to address that uh, with competition. Yeah, that's exactly the, uh, the point. Um, I'm looking at your name. I don't know. Basically, uh, eight, eight constants with no vowels. Um, that's exactly the situation. And they're also looking at video games. And this is something that I consider to be, I don't know if it's a coincidence or irony, but one thing that 4th edition did, one of the reasons why 4th edition looks the way it looks is because they were looking at massively online RPGs that were huge at the time. World, World of Warcraft was probably never bigger than it was back in uh, 2008, 2010. It was massive. And so when they looked at that and said, make our rule system act like an MMO, which is the reason why 4th edition looks the way it looks is because it actually acts like an MMO with the powers. It's very MMO inspired. And then they wanted to create a, a, a 
a virtual system with uh, with uh, with D and D Insider and so forth that would be where you could use that in that architecture. And now, with virtual tabletops and so forth, Wizards is now looking at this situation again, going, "We are going to look at video games, but instead of looking at MMOs and looking at how they built their rule system." They're looking at video game companies, AAA companies, and going, look at how much money EA and Activision are making, ignoring the fact that they have the worst public image, that in mass, they have massive hatred from, from, their, from their audience. EA was named the worst company in America for three years in a row, and yet they are still one of the biggest com- companies. Activision is one of the biggest companies. Activision Blizzard is, is massive because they make shit tons of money through monetization efforts outside of the initial purchase of a title. They don't want you owning your game. You don't own your game anymore. Everything's on online. And we see with Square Enix, if a game isn't popular, they shut down their servers. And so no one can play them. Even people who paid good money, they shut down like Babylon's Fall or what have you. And if you go to the uh, video game sites, uh, commentaries, that's all they scream about is how screwed up the video game um, uh, tapestry is because of what's happening. Um, they are everything is online, everything is microtransactioned, everything is a is a is a live service, and that's exactly what D and D is trying to be. They do not want you to pay forty bucks to get these three physical books and then never see you again. They you want you paying nine dollars a month on their virtual system, on their virtual tabletop. They don't want you spending money to go on Roll20. They want you on their system paying monthly. They want to monetize you on a monthly basis. Um, And the funny thing is, they tried this with 4th edition, and it did not work. And now here we are 15 years later, and they are trying the exact same system again, except the fact now they have a lot more evidence that it works because the AAA companies succeeded in 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 convincing people to accept microtransactions in their games and when you see people decrying microtransactions and then ea says oh by the way we made 600 million dollars on microtransactions last year we're like wait a sec we all hate microtransactions who's doing it and the answer is the people who aren't talking the kids the whales the neurodivergent that are getting preyed upon this is the absolute truth. And what we're seeing right now and that happened with Activision, with EA, with Square Enix, they're doing that now. The, I wouldn't be surprised if like if, if it wasn't if, if if all this happened three years ago, you guarantee D and D would be going full crypto with NFTs. Um, I think by the time D and D six comes out they'll know like oh no there's no point following nft this is this is stupid they might still do it though but they are looking at video games and going let's match up our games are already on digital so people are playing our our games digitally just like people would play among us so let's do it like that let's make a situation where people have to pay every month and and and, and do that and so to quote um, James Stephanie Sterling, they don't want some money. They don't want a lot of money. They want all the money. And we know that from a corporate standpoint that this is always going to eventually fail because there's a, there's a limit of how much money that you can get. And they are going to pursue that to their own detriment. They will push. And that means killing competition, making sure they're, they're the only player in town. And yeah, there is an argument to make the fact that they spent all of their energy trying to make D&D the de facto system that everyone uses to create, in essence, a monopoly. But they created that monopoly by letting third-party companies fill in the gaps that they couldn't. But now that D&D has a massive penetration, they want to cut all of that out so that they maintain that monopoly without the third-party support. Um, Mike Merles was easy to chat with over social media. Yeah, him and I, we haven't, I never spoke personally. We spoke through emails. Um, and I really liked him. I thought he was a cool guy. I liked the fact that he reached out to me. Um, uh, obviously we've had some controversies about what happened with his departure and his, some, some things he's, some things he's done. I won't comment on that cause that's not part of the, uh, what this video is about. Uh, but yeah, I'll say that Mike Merles wasn't really bad to me personally, but that, that's how it is. Uh, isn't RPG systems fudge and fate built on the OGL? 
<coughs> uh, I have no idea. Um, this is a weakness that I do. I when I'm uh, part of the reason because I have ADHD and I am oddly enough on the spectrum. And if you guys ever wonder why I don't look in the camera, that's why. Because if I look in the camera, I have problems focusing on my on what I'm saying. So if you ever wonder why I don't look at the camera, sometimes I'm reading off a script. I'm not this time. But in this situation, it's because my neurodivergence prevents me from looking at the cameras and looking at people's faces. It's just how it is. So please uh, just, uh, just bear with me on that one. Um, uh, I don't look at other OGL systems. I don't read other third-party books. Uh, books that often and I don't purchase a lot of additional 5e official books and there's a couple reasons for that the first one is that I don't want to be influenced and I don't want people accusing me of ripping off somebody else's idea so I want my ideas to be entirely original so I go in directions that are very strange and some people have said oh this is just like this I go oh that's possible I don't read that book because I, I tend to avoid it because I don't want people saying you rip this off of this I am honest when I do rip off things like ultra modern has the life path system out of uh, Mechton Zeta it has life path system out of cyberpunk we have the mecha system out of the MTS um, and I and I don't uh, you know I don't complain about that I, I've made this life path system as a replacement for backgrounds and then uh, there's a a first party D and D book that has the almost exact same life path system as me and do I think that they're copying it from the original Cyberpunk 2020 no I think they're copying it off of me and I copied it from Cyberpunk 2020 but at least I'm honest about it at least I'm honest in saying. I took this from Cyberpunk 2020, and I wish they would be honest in saying we took it from, from D6 Machina, who took it from, from Cyberpunk 2020. Uh, but they can't ever admit that they borrowed an idea from somebody else because, once again, we're in a situation where Cyberpunk can't go after me because I'm not copy-pasting their thing. I'm creating a new system that's based off of that system. It's a rule system. That is part of this community. We're always playing off of each other. But that still being said, I like having original content. So I generally won't read someone else's third-party book. And to be honest, and this happened with 4th edition as well, where the vast majority of 5th edition products aren't really breaking, or not really thinking outside the box. They're not really working outside of them. They're not trying to break the mold. Uh, they always want to play within the lines. And with 4th edition, I was aggressively told by a lot of people to do that, to play within the lines, to, um, to not break out of that mold and I was told quite, quite specifically you can't do non-fantasy with fourth edition and I said hold my beer and I made ultra modern four and but ultra modern four was a little a little on the safe side so when I so I put out more stuff and, and, and put out apex and neurospasta and apex was me saying you want to see me break fourth edition to do it something that you don't think it can do I'm going to completely just break it down down to its core and create a system that is is that is 100% compatible but looks completely unfamiliar. Fifth edition, thankfully, I still get people who say you can't do non-fantasy, but that's such a quiet group. And a lot of people don't know, but I, I like reiterating that Ultra Modern 5 was the first big, major non-fantasy book. The OGL came out in January 2016. We came out in August. Amethyst came out in May. So we came out with a non-fantasy book before a lot of people. And that's the reason why Ultra Modern 5 got to be so, so successful. But I think... That told a lot of people, oh, yeah, not only is there the possibility of creating non-fantasy for 5th edition, there's also a gigantic market because we went platinum in three months, which I that which has never happened to me. Um, now, both the original and the Ultra Modern Redo are both Mithril. Ultra Modern 5 Redo got Mithril faster than the original Ultra Modern. I wish I could combine those sales together. If I can combine those sales together, then I'd be adamantine and I would have an adamantine title but unfortunately they're separate and it's gonna be a long time before i get an adamantine badge on any of them i'm about a thousand books away still so um yeah it's interesting that we have that situation so we have a bunch of products that are coming out that are non-fantasy for fifth edition however whenever i talk with fans who, that read these because i generally avoid them they say a lot of these books do are very safe they don't break these rules so much not like ultra modern did when it created a mecha construction system or broke up life paths into the you know, this into the big four page set of tables and, and numbers you can roll and affinity was the same way affinity was me going i'm going to break the system in every way safe and possible i created not one not two but three completely different non-vancy and magic systems um 
One involved a deck of cards, and I like the idea of playing around with mechanics that aren't in 5th edition D&D as a way of playing around with the system. Having deck building in a steampunk magic system, for example. And going into Amethyst, I want to play with that as well. I want to create new mechanics that are compatible with 5th edition but are unfamiliar to the core set. And I can do that because I don't follow the o- I don't technically follow the OGL. I'm, I don't. I, I think because I break away from uh, the model of of how you're supposed to write, I think that actually helps me out. Four um, E was easy to DM at level one to four, but was horrible after that. There was so much to track. My brain exploded. Essentials Four E was better. Uh, that is true. Essentials Four E was nice because it gave you the utility powers, but the combat powers were more like traditional three point five. It was a blending of all the best stuff of four and all the best stuff of three. That's why I really liked um, Fourth Edition for that architecture. The biggest difference, and people ask me, why don't you write for Pathfinder? I go, one of the reasons why I don't write for Pathfinder is that even though I love Pathfinder as a system and I love Paizo and the people who work for Paizo, I hate writing for Pathfinder. It is one of the hardest systems to write for. I wrote Amethyst for five different systems. Fourth edition, fifth edition, uh, Cyber World Fake Core, um, and, and Pathfinder. And the hardest one to write was the Pathfinder. Now, that being said, I didn't write the Savage Rule of Fate core. Chris Stilson wrote those. 13th Age was the easiest one because it was, a, it was a 4E variant. It was very easy to write for. The rules are very simple, simplistic. They have the best monsters. Um, and, <coughs> um, but fourth, the third, the 13th Age, based off of 4th edition, what 4th what edition did was that was different was that 4th edition was written for DMs in mind. They were right. 80% of the market is defined by Dungeon Masters. 80% of your money comes from Dungeon Masters. So why are you writing your books with the player as a priority? And 4th edition put the GM first and made it easy. That's why creating monsters for 4th edition was so much easier than making Monsters of Pathfinder. When I got to the monster chapter in Pathfinder, it took me a month to write it. It was such a colossal pain in the ass. Fourth edition, they give you a wonderful set of checks and balances and a wonderful structure to create a balance uh, a monster for that. And I love them for it. Yes, it was frustrating. They changed all of that with the third monster manual, but that's beside the point. And there were other ways to they, they, they did. They made skills really easy. They put the ownership of saving throws in the hands of the players. So now we had our defense. You had a reflex defense, a mental defense, and your AC, which means if I had 10 kobolds and the guy casts a fireball, I am not the one that's r- rolling all the saving throws. The player who casts a spell has to. And that was critically important. I love the fact that it took a lot of that ownership out of the DM's hand. If you're casting that spell, you have to make those rolls, not me. Um, I like the fact that 4th edition introduced minions, a way of creating large chaff without having to track their hit points, um, to the point that I pulled some of these ideas out of 4th edition and put them in my 5th edition. I have minions. Um, they use a little different rule system. Their AC goes up a little bit. Three of them count as one, and their hit points are radically reduced. But I do have that idea of minions, and I think minions are critically important in the system. I like, and if I, if I ever created a system whole cloth, if I said, I'm going to write my own system based off of D20, um, I have two options. I can make it 100% 5e compatible, but if I, if I didn't, I wanted to make a system that was entirely original. It would be a hybrid of four and five. It would have character classes that look like 5th edition, but the definitions were from 4th edition. 4th edition was, was strict in its definition because it was supposed to be a primarily a tabletop game, where 5th edition 3.5 could be in the, in the field of the mind. You could play 5th edition in your mind without worrying about a tabletop. 4th edition, you needed that. I would make it fifth, uh, basically 13th Age. Let's be honest. 13th Age is this wonderful hybrid that took all the best stuff of 4th Edition into the one idea. I would take that same thing, all the great stuff that I liked about 4th Edition and combined it with 5th Edition and created something that was wholly new. Um, I'm so tempted to that, I may actually do that. And if the OGL completely uh, craps up the industry, that might be something I may turn to. But 5th um, Edition goes back off of that it still makes it easier for a gm monsters aren't as hard but once again they put a lot of more ownership on dice rolls in the gm's hand where it should be in the players 
So giving us saving throws was a bit annoying. Fifth edition is kind of this middle of the ground. It, it, it made things easier for GMs, but then put a lot more emphasis on the players rather than us. <coughs> so, um, yeah. So as a result, yeah, 4E was an incredibly easy system to DM. The only downside with it was that we'd be playing, talking and role playing and so forth. And like, okay, there's a battle. And then there's this jarring stop where we roll out the mat or the mat's already rolled out. I give the description. We put our guys down. We take minutes to set up the, the combat. And then we play the combat for an hour. And then we stop. We go back to role playing. That was the, the annoying thing. The idea of having a quick two-second fight. I roll my dice. I attack this guy. And then that battle is over. I don't have to to shift gears into the tabletop. And that was the reason why I like 13th Age, because 13th Age gave you that 4th edition architecture without having to use the tabletop. Uh, that being said, uh, 13th Age was also almost too loosey-goosey. Like, it was so abstract. Uh, like, the monsters had, what, five entries? Tops? Like, a monster stat in 13th Age was, like, this big. But, yeah, 4th edi- edition was, was DM-inspired and DM-centric, and I missed that. Um... Yeah, I've realized for a few years that Dungeons & Dragons 5e was not being made for me, but I wanted it, it to be to make it popular. Um, yeah, I disagree with that to a point. I think 5e was made for everybody. We had the books, we had the digital. It was made for everybody. The issue is, is that a huge chunk of everybody don't give Wizards any more money. And so 5th edition is for all of us. And D&D is for all of us. And what Wizards is doing is creating a new... 5.5, but now knowing what we were talking about, they're probably going to make it 100% incompatible so they can do the same thing they did with 4th edition and go the 6th edition rules. Because right now, the playtest rules that are online are 100% 5th edition compatible. They are 100% 5th edition comp- compatible. But I wouldn't be surprised when we get to the summer and we get these updated files, things are going to change and we're going to start seeing rules pop in that do make it incompatible. Uh, that's unfortunate, but that's just that's just the way it's going to work. But I would disagree to saying D and D was not being made for me. D and D is made for everybody, but I think this new edition is being made for a very s- small group of whales that want to pay wizards money every month, and they are gambling that there are more people that they can make more money off of the small group of whales than they can from the large group of people, which can make sense considering people like me don't give wizards any more money. A lot of people watching this probably haven't given wizards a lot of money. And that's what they need. They need to monetize these players. They need to monetize these players and they know that the vast majority of players will object, but they're banking that what that small group, they'll make enough money off of that group. And I can I can see their argument. I don't like it, but I can see their argument. Um please post uh, a link to level up. Uh, it's on End World. I, I unfortunately I don't know much about it, so it's it's difficult for me to really talk about it. Um, we know that the Ryan dancing thing happened. That both, um, so Battle Zoo shares the OGL one point one. Okay, so yeah, um, I could read the OGL if I wanted. Um, I don't need to know. I know the important things. So going through the whole twenty page nine thousand word document. Uh, is it's kind of unnecessary. Uh, I, I I will I will base it off of what other people are interpreting, uh, but yeah, you can you can find it on N World somewhere. I don't know exactly where it is, but it's on N World somewhere. Um, there's an open letter for Watsi. We do know that one or two companies are proceeding on, on legal action. We'll see if it's, if it's an empty threat. Uh, but yes, I know the OGL. Anyone who who wants to read the leaked OGL can do that now. Um. And for me, uh, I'm not terribly interested in doing that. I'm not terribly interested in doing that. Uh, so finally, it comes down to this. Uh, if, if anyone has any more final questions, uh, please post it now. But um, our kind of disclaimer here is that uh, DSS Machina, if the OGL comes out in this format, uh, DSS Machina will not be publishing under the OGL. The original OGL was published in 2000, conceived in 1999. It was intended to be it was intended to be a perpetual, irrevocable, royalty-free license as a way to unify a fractured industry and to increase the D&D brand without Wizards of the Coast investing in broad product lines. 
they no longer possess this that vision and now see OGL as a way for third-party companies to profit off of D&D's IP. Firstly, I use 5e system because it is encompasses and it, it's all it is encompassing and broadly accepted. The moment another system harnesses that level of penetration, we'd switch. We have no loyalty to D&D as an IP or as a business identity. We are tied to a series of rules which a company cannot cooperate that were contributed by a series of game designers 20 years ago. So to say that we are profiting off of Hasbro's IP without paying royalty is erroneous and factually incorrect. We never mention D&D in our books, and we never will. D D uh, DSS Machina has adhered to the OGL more as a courtesy than anything else. We don't copy-paste rules from the SRD. We add additional content and our insistence that you still need the Core 5e trilogy to play our game is actually our saving grace, allowing us to effectively abandon the OGL in scripture. So from here on, all DEM products will no longer be OGL compliant. Uh, we are still waiting for the official announcement. We're not going to make any changes until then. Um, uh, sure, man. Yeah, I do have some questions, but I do have a live stream 15 minutes. I'm going to end my stream in about five minutes anyway. Uh, so maybe I'll, uh, I'll switch from mine to watching yours. Uh, but yeah, we can absolutely chat whenever you wish. Uh, uh, so anyway, so we are going to wait to the official stand. Now, we know that Wizards is watching this situation, and they are, if they were belligerent, if they wanted to post this without having to worry about the ramifications and they didn't care, they would have posted this when the leak went live and just weathered it. They didn't. And according to this draft, which is probably was probably written not it was probably written four or five weeks ago, it probably wasn't popular. Somebody leaked it out to generate the negativity, to send a message to wizards. So there is our people within the tight community that are probably on our side. Um some people may suspect that it was part of this conference call that some company signed in today. They got the got it, and then one of them leaked it. I actually seem to think maybe it might have been somebody internal within Wizards that are that that was uh, sympathetic to our to our situation. Um, but the fact that they have not published it, so when they make it official, it will not look like this document. There is another document that they're probably working on. Uh, because I'll look at that later. Uh, what we have the situation here is that um, they're probably looking at it because right now, if they po post it, I think we all have one week to adhere to the OGL, which is ridiculous. Um, they're probably going if they if the best case, worst case scenario, they publish it as printed, but they give us two weeks with a contract that's slightly amended. Best case in uh, best case scenario, if we have three best case scenarios, one, the OGL is um, they come out and say, yeah, obviously this is not working. We are canceling this new OGL completely, and that's it. Or this one's going to stay forward. We're going to show you all the cool stuff that you'll get if you sign on to VTT, onto the new 1.1, but we are not retiring the 1.1. You can still produce product for 5th edition, but look at all the cool stuff you can do with 5.5 or 6th edition. We'll give you images. We can give you links. You can sell on our page. You can play on our virtual tabletop. Look at all this cool stuff that we can do. But if you go, but you, you can still do, I think that is probably the best case scenario that we can hope for. The fact that they'll cancel the, the, this whole new controversy seems hard to believe. They'll find some way to dance it in their favor or do it in such a way that appeases most of us, but not all. There'll be some people that'll be very upset still, but the vast majority of us will be placated. That's the best case scenario. Um, so f if they do make it official and it is like and it's worded the way it's worded in this leak um we will no longer be ogl compliant we will not feature ogl language and over the course of the next month we will be updating our 5e products to ensure our compliance as an un unauthorized 5e product it's really easy for amethyst and affinity they were done really recently um if i'm going to do it for apex pam uh neurospasta and ultra modern that's going to take a bit longer because I have to make sure that the dialogue is basically correct and language backs us up. Um, and it sucks because I already have a brand new batch of books in distribution that are based off of the old system. <coughs> uh, they will not be destroyed. They're going out distribution and we'll just weather that. 
Wants he believes they can enforce a policy change by engaging in unlawful activity. This will not fly, and the moment an IP agnostic D20 based OGL is made available, we will sign on to that contract and our legal language will change. So that is basically it. Uh, I've got 10 minutes before 10 to 1. I've been at this probably for more than an hour. I have no idea. It's probably a really long time. Um, thank you, for everyone. If you have any final thoughts, uh, add it now. Uh, other than that, I am going to head out. I'll give it another minute until 12.50 or so. Uh, but uh, yeah, to reiterate, at least this is working. At least this is working. I know it's, it's probably blocking my face. I don't have an actual blue screen, so this is the best we could do. If I had a blue screen, then this would look a lot better. Um, thankfully, I have a very smooth arch here, so it's really easy to cut it out. Um, but um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, anyway, uh, I can see no more questions here, so I will close it. I probably won't do another live uh, stream until um, this thing gets official. I do have some stuff on Naramata uh, to deal with, but anyone who deals with D&D &D doesn't have to worry about it. That's our board game. But anyway, guys, go ahead and, and, uh, and have a good time. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, and if you have any questions, post it. And uh, I, I engage with people a lot, so I'm pretty easy to get a hold of, and I respond pretty quickly. Uh, but anyway, this is Chris uh, from Day6 Machina.